Chapter 16 of The Lost Continent by C. J. Cutcliffe Hine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lost Continent by C. J. Cutcliffe Hine. Chapter 16 Siege of the Sacred Mountain. Now, my passage across the great continent of Atlantis, if tedious and haunted by many dangers, need not be recounted in detail here. Only one halt did I make of any duration, and that was unavoidable. I had killed a stag one day, bringing it down after a long chase in an open savanna. I scented the air carefully, to see if there was any other beast which could do me harm within reach, and thinking that the place was safe, set about cutting my meat and making a sufficiency into a bundle for carriage. But underfoot, amongst the grasses, there was a great legged worm, a monstrous green thing, very venomous in its bite, and presently, as I moved, I brushed it with my heel, and like a dart of light it swooped with its tiny head and struck me with its fangs in the lower thigh. With my knife I cut through its neck, and it fell to writhing and struggling and twining its hundred legs into all manner of contortions and then, cleaning my blade in the ground, I stabbed with it deep all round the wound, so that the blood might flow freely and wash the venom from its lodgment. And then, with the blood trickling healthily down from my heel, I shouldered the meat and strode off, thankful for being so well quit of what might have made itself a very ugly adventure. As I walked, however, my leg began to be filled with a tightness and throbbing which increased every hour and presently it began to swell also, till the skin was stretched like drawn parchment. I was taken, too, with a sickness that racked me violently, and if one of the greater and more dangerous beasts had come upon me then, he would have eaten me without a fight. With the fall of darkness I managed to haul myself up into a tree, and there abode in the crutch of a limb, in wakefulness and pain throughout the night. With the dawn, when the night beasts had gone to their lairs, I clambered down again, and leaning heavily on my spear, limped onwards through the somber forests along my way. The moss which grows on the northern side of each tree was my guide, but gradually I began to note that I was seeing moss all round the trees, and in fact was growing light-headed with the pain and the swelling of the limb. But still I pressed onwards with my journey, my last instinct being to obey the command of the High Council and so procure the enlargement of Nais as had been promised. My last memory was of being met by someone in the black forest who aided me, and there my waking senses took wings into forgetfulness. But after an interval wit returned, and I found myself on a bed of leaves in a cleft between two rocks, which was furnished with some poor skill, and fortified with stakes and buildings against the entrance of the larger marauding beasts. My wound was dressed with a poultice of herbs, and at the other side of the cavern there squatted a woman, cooking a mess of wood-grubs and honey over a fire of sticks. "'How came I here?' I asked. "'I brought you,' said she. "'And who are you?' "'A nymph, they call me, and I practice as such, collecting herbs and curing the diseases of those that come to me, telling fortunes and making predictions. In return, I receive what each can afford, and if they do not pay according to their means, I clap on a curse to make them wither. It's a lean enough living when wars and the pestilence have left so few poor folk to live in the land. Do you visit Atlantis? Not I, for a niece would have me boiled in brine, living, if she could lay easy hands on me. Our dainty empress tolerates no magic but her own. They say— she is for pulling down the priests off their mountain now. So you do get news of the city? Assuredly. It is my trade to get good news, or otherwise how could I tell fortunes to the vulgar? You see, my lord, I detected your quality by your speech, and knowing you are not one of those that come to me for spells and potions, I have no fear in speaking to you plainly. Tell me, then, for a niece still reigns? most vilely. As a maiden? As the mother of twin sons. 
Tatho's her husband now, and has been these three years. Tatho! Who followed him as viceroy of Yucatan? There is no Yucatan, a vast nation of little hairy men, so the tale goes, coming from the west overran the country. They had clubs of wood tipped with stone as their only arm, but numbers made their chief weapon. They had no desire for plunder, or taking of slaves, or the conquering of cities. To eat the flesh of Atlanteans was their only lust, and they followed it prodigiously. Their numbers were like the bees in a swarm. They came to each of the cities in Yucatan in turn, and though the colonists slew them in thousands, the weight of numbers always prevailed. They ate clean each city they took, and left it to the beasts of the forest, and went on to the next. And so, in time, they reached the coast towns, and Tatho and the few that survived took ship and sailed home. They even ate Tatho's wife for him. They must be curious, persevering things, these little hairy men. The gods send they do not get across the seas to Atlantis, or they would be worse plagued to the poor country than for an ease. Now I had heard of these little hairy creatures before, and though, indeed, I had never seen them, I had gathered that they were a little less than human, and a little more than bestial, a link, so to speak, between the two orders, and specially held in check by the gods in certain forest solitudes. Also I had learned that, on occasion, when punishment was needful, they could be set loose as a devastating army upon men, devouring all before them. But I said nothing of this to the nymph, she being but a vulgar woman, and indeed half silly, as is always the case with these self-styled sorceresses who gull the ignorant, common folk. But within myself I was bitterly grieved at the fate of that fine colony of Yucatan, in which I had expended such an infinity of pains to do my share of the building. But it did not suit my purpose to have my name and quality blazoned abroad till the time was full and so I said nothing to the nymph about Yucatan. But let the talk continue upon other matters. "'What about Egypt?' I asked. "'In its accustomed darkness, so they say. Who cares for Egypt these latter days? Who cares for anyone, or anything for that matter, except for himself, and his own proper estate? Time was when the country folk and the hunters hereabouts brought me offerings to this cave for sheer piety's sake. But now they never come near unless they see a way of getting good value in return for their gifts. And, by result, instead of living fat and hearty, I make lean meals off honey and grubs. It's a poor life, a nymphs, in these latter years, I tell you, my lord. It's the fashion for all classes to believe in no kind of mystery now. What manner of pestilence is this you spoke of? I have not seen it, but thank the gods it has not come this way. But they do say that it has grown from the folk for Anise has slain, and whose bodies remain unburied. She is always slaying, and so the bodies lie thicker than the birds and beasts can eat them. For which of our sins, I wonder, did the gods let for Anise come to reign? I wish that she and her twins were boiled alive in brine before they came between an honest nymph of the forest and her living. They say she has put an image of herself in all the temples of the city now, and has ordered prayers and sacrifices to be made night and morning. She has decreed all other gods inferior to herself, and forbidden their worship. And those of the people that are not sufficiently devout for her taste have their hamstrings slit by her tormentors to aid them constantly into a devotional attitude. Will you eat of my grubs and honey? There is nothing else. Your back was bloody with carrying meat when I met you, but you had lost your load. You must either taste this mess of mine now, or go without." I harbored with that nymph in cave six days, she using her drugs and charms to cure my leg the while, and when I was recovered, I hunted the plains and killed her a fat cloven-hoofed horse as payment, and then went along my ways. The country from there onwards had at one time carried a sturdy population which held its own firmly, and, as its numbers grew, took in more ground and built more homesteads farther afield. 
The houses were perched in trees for the most part, as there they were out of reach of cave bear and cave tiger and the other more dangerous beasts. But others, and these were the better ones, were built on the ground, of logs so ponderous and so firmly clamped and dovetailed that the beasts could not pull them down, and once inside a house of this fashion its owners were safe, and could probe at any attackers through the interstices between the logs, and often wound, sometimes, make a kill. But not one in ten of these outlying settlers remained. The houses were silent when I reached them, the fire-hearth before the door weed-grown and the patch of vegetables taken back by the greedy fingers of the forest, into mere scrub and jungle. And farther on, when villages began to appear, strongly walled as the custom is to ward off the attacks of beasts, the logs which aforetime had barred the gateway lay strewn in a sprouting undergrowth, and naught but the kitchen middens remained to prove that once they had sheltered human tenants. Foranice's influence seemed to have spread, as though it were some horrid blight over the whole face of what was once a smiling and easy-living land. So far I had met with little enough interference from any men I had come across. Many had fled with their women into the depths of the forest at the bare sight of me. Some stood their ground with a threatening face, but made no offer to attack, seeing that I did not offer them insult first. And a few, a very few, offered me shelter and provision. But as I neared the city, and began to come upon muddy beaten paths, I passed through governments that were more thickly populated, and here appeared strong chance of delay. The watcher in the tower which is set above each village would spy me and cry, "'Here is a masterless man!' And then the people that were within would rush out with intent to spoil me of my weapons, and afterwards to appoint me as a laborer. I had no desire to slay these wretched folk, being filled with pity at the state to which they had fallen. And often words served me to make them stand aside from the path, and stare wonderingly at my fierceness, and let me go my ways. And when at other times words had no avail, I strove to strike as lightly as could be, my object being to get forward with my journey and leave no unnecessary dead behind me. Indeed, having found the modern way of these villages, it grew to be my custom to turn off into the forest and make a circuit whenever I came within smell of their garbage. Similarly, too, when I got farther on and came amongst greater towns, also I kept beyond challenge of their walls, having no mind to risk delay from the whim of any new law which might chance to be set up by their governors. My progress might be slinking, but my pride did not upbraid me very loudly. Indeed, the fever of haste burned within me so hot, and I had little enough carrying space for other emotions. But at last I found myself within a half-day's journey the city of Atlantis itself, with the sacred mountain and its ring of fires looming high beside it, and the call for caution became trebly accentuated. Everywhere evidences showed that the country had been drained of its fighting men. Everywhere women prayed that the battles might end with the rout of the priests or the killing of Foranice, so that the wretched land might have peace and time to lick its wounds. An army was investing the sacred mountain and its one approach was most narrowly guarded. Even after having journeyed so far, it seemed as if I should have to sit hopelessly down without being able to carry out the orders which had been laid upon me by the High Council, and earn the reward which had been promised. Force would be useless here. I should have one good fight, a gorgeous fight, one man against an army, and my usefulness would be ended. No. This was the occasion for guile, and I found covert in the outskirts of a wood, and lay there cudgelling my brain for a plan. Across the plain before me lay the grim great walls of the city, with the heads of its temples and its palaces and its pyramids showing beyond. The step-sides of the royal pyramid held my eye. Foranice had expended some of her new-found store of gold in overlaying their former whiteness with sheets of shining yellow metal but it was not that change that moved me. I was remembering that, in the square before the pyramid, there stood a throne of granite carved with the snake and the outstretched hand, 
and in the hollow beneath the throne was Nais, my love, asleep these eight years now because of the drug that had been given to her, but alive still and waiting for me, if only I on my part could make a way to the place where Zaman defied the Empress and announced my coming. In that covert of the woods I lay a day and a night raging with myself for not discovering some plan to get within the defences of the sacred mountain, but in the morning which followed there came a man towards me running. "'You need not threaten me with your weapons,' he cried. "'I mean no harm. It seems that you are Deucalion, though I should not have known you myself in those rags and skins, and behind that tangle of hair and beard. You will give me your good word, I know. Believe me, I have not loitered unduly.' He was a lower priest whom I knew, and held in little esteem. His name was Roe, a greedy fellow and not overworthy of trust. "'From whom do you come?' I asked. Zaman laid a command on me. He came to my house, though how he got there I cannot tell, seeing that Foranisa's army blocks all possible passage to and from the mountain. I told him I wished to be mixed with none of his schemings. I am a peaceful man, Deucalion, and have taken a wife who requires nourishment. I still serve in the same temple, though we have swept out the old gods by order of the Empress, and put her image in their place. The people are tidily pious nowadays, those that are left of them, and the living is consequently easy. Yes, I tell you, there are far more offerings now than there were in the old days and so I had no wish to be mixed with matters which might well make me deprived of a snug post and my head to boot. I can believe it all of you, Roe. But there was no denying Zaman. He burst into one of his black furies, and while he spoke at me I tell you I felt as good as dead. You know his powers? I have seen some of them. Well, the gods alone know which are true gods and which are the others. I serve the one that gives me employment. But those that Zaman serves give him power, and that's beyond denying. You see that right hand of mine? It is dead and paralyzed from the wrist, and that is a gift of Zaman. He bestowed it, he said, to make me collect my attention. Then he said more hard things concerning what he was pleased to term my apostasy, not letting me put up a word in my own defense of how the change was forced upon me and finally said he, I might either do his bidding on a certain matter to the letter, or take that punishment which my falling away from the old gods had earned. I shall not kill you, said he, but I will cover all your limbs with a paralysis, such as you have tasted already, and when at length death reaches you in some gutter you will welcome it. If Zaman said those words, he meant them. So you accepted the alternative? Had I, with a wife depending on me, any other choice? I asked his pleasure. It was to find you when you came in here from some distant part of the land and deliver to you his message. Then tell me where is the meeting place, said I, and when. There is none appointed, nor is the day fixed, said he. You must watch and search always for him, but when he comes you will be guided to his place. Well, Deucalion, I think I was guided, but how I do not know. But now I have found you, and if there's such a thing as gratitude, I ask you to put in your word with Zaman that this deadness be taken away from my hand. It's an awful thing for a man to be forced to go through life like this, for no real fault of his own, and Zaman could cure it from where he sat if he was so minded. You seem still to have a very full faith in some of the old god's priests," I said. But so far I do not see that your errand is done. I have had no message yet. Why, the message is so simple that I do not see why he could not have got someone else to carry it. You are to make a great blaze. You may fire the grasses of the plain in front of this wood if you choose, and on the night which follows you are to go round to that flank of the sacred mountain away from the city, where the rocks run down sheer, and there they will lower a rope and haul you up to their hands above. It seems easy, 
and I thank you for your pains. I will ask Zaman that your hand be restored to you. You shall have my prayers if it is. And look to Kalian, it is a small matter, and it would be less likely to slip your memory if you saw to it at once on your landing. Later you may be disturbed. For Anise is bound to pull you down off your perch up there, now she has made her mind to it. She never fails, once she has set her hand to a thing. Indeed, if she was no goddess at birth, she is making herself into one very rapidly. She has got all the ancient learning of our priests, and more besides. She has discovered the secret of life these recent months." "'She has found that?' I cried, fairly startled. "'How? Tell me how! Only the three know that! It is beyond our knowledge even who are members of the seven. I know nothing of her means, but she has the secret, and now she is as good and immortal, so she says, as any of them. Well, Deucalion, it is dangerous for me to be missing from my temple over long, so I will go. You will carry that matter we spoke of in your mind. It means much to me." His eye wandered over my ragged person. And if you think my service is of value to you— You see me poor, my man, and practically destitute. Some small coin, he murmured, or even a link of bronze? I am at great expense just now buying nourishment for my wife. Well, if you have nothing, you cannot give, so I'll just bid you farewell." He took himself off then, and I was not sorry. I had never liked Roe. But I wasted no more precious time then. The grass blazed up for a signal almost before his timorous heels were clear of it, and that night, when the darkness gave me cover, I took the risk of what beasts might be prowling and went to the place appointed. There was no rope dangling, but presently one came down the smooth cliff face like some slender snake. I made a loop, slipped it over a leg, and pulled hard as a signal. Those above began to haul, and so I went back to the sacred mountain after an absence of so many toilsome and warring years. There were none to disturb the ascent for Anissa's troops had no thought to guard that gaunt, bare, seamless precipice. The men who hauled me up were old, and panted heavily with their task, and until I knew the reason I wondered why a knot of younger priests had not been appointed for the duty. But I put no question. With us, the priests' clan on the sacred mountain, it is always taken as granted that when an order is given, it is given for the best. Besides, these priests did not offer themselves to question. They took me off at once to Zaman, and that is what I could have wished. The old man greeted me with the royal sign. All hail to Deucalion, King of Atlantis, duly called thereto by the High Council of Priests. Is Foranis dead? I asked. It remains for you to slay her, and take your kingdom, if indeed, when all is done, there remains a man or a rood of land to govern. The sentence has gone out that she is to die, and it shall be carried into effect, even though we have to set loose the most dreadful powers that are stored in the Ark of the Mysteries, and wreck this continent in our effort. We have borne with her infamies all these years by command set down by the Most High Gods, but now she has gone beyond endurance, and they it is who have given the word for her cutting off. You are one of the highest three. I am only one of the seven. You best know the cost. There can be no counting the cost now, my brother and my king. It is an order." It is an order, I repeated formally. So I obey. If it were not impious to do so, it would be easy to justify this decision of the gods. The woman has usurped the throne. Yet she was forgiven and bidden rule unwisely. She has tampered with our holy religion, yet she was forgiven. She has killed the peoples of Atlantis in greedy useless wars, and destroyed the country's trade, yet she was forgiven. She has desecrated the old temples, and latterly has set up in them images of herself to be worshipped as a deity, yet she was forgiven. But at last, her evil cleverness has discovered to her the tremendous secret of life and death, 
and there she has overstepped the boundary of the high god's forbearance. I myself went to carry a final warning, and once more faced her in the great banqueting hall. Solemnly I recited to her the edict, and she chose to take it as a challenge. She would live on eternally herself, and she would share her knowledge with those that pleased her. Tatho, that was her husband, should also be immortal. Indeed, if she thought fit, she would cry this secret aloud so that even the common people might know it, and death from mere age would become a legend. She cared no whit how she might upset the laws of nature. She was for Anise, and was the highest law of all. And finally she defied me there in that banqueting hall, and defied also the high gods that stood behind my mouth. "'My magic is as strong as yours, you pompous fool!' she cried, "'and presently you shall see the two stand side by side upon your trial.' She began to collect an army from that moment, and we, on our part, made our preparations. It was discovered by our arts that you still lived, and King of Atlantis you were made by solemn election. How you were summoned you know as nearly as it is lawful that one of your degree should know. How you came, you understand best yourself. But here you are, my brother, and being king now, you must order all things as you see best for the preservation of your high estate, and we others live only to give you obedience. Then, being king, I can speak without seeming to make a use of a threat. I must have my queen first, or I am not strong enough to give my whole mind to this ruling. She shall be brought here. So, then, I will be a general now, and see to the defences of this place, and view the men who are here to stand behind them." I went out of the dwelling then, Zaman giving place and following me. It was night still, but there was no darkness on the upper part of the sacred mountain. A ring of fires, fed eternally from the earth-breath which wells up from below, burns round one half of the crest, lighting it always as bright as day. And in fact, forming no small part of its fortification. Indeed, it is said that, in the early dawn of history, men first came to the mountain as a stronghold because of the natural defence which the fires offered. There is no bridging these flames or smothering them. On either side of their line for a hundred paces the ground glows with heat, and a man would be turned to ash who tried to cross it. Round full one-half the mountain slopes the fires make a rampart unbreakable and on the other side the rock runs in one sheer precipice from the crest to the plain, which spreads beyond its foot. But it is on this farther side that there is the only entranceway which gives passage to the crest of the sacred mountain from below. Running diagonally up the steep face of the cliff is a gigantic fissure, which succeeding ages, as man has grown more luxurious, have made more easy to climb. Looking at the additions, in the ancient days I can well imagine that none but the most daring could have made the ascent. But one generation has thrown a bridge over a bad gap here, and another has cut into the living stone and widened a ledge there, till in these latter days there is a path with cut steps and a carved balustrade, such as the feeblest or most giddy might traverse with little effort or exertion. But always when these improvers made smooth the obstacles, they were careful to weaken in no possible way the natural defences but rather to add to them. Eight gates of stone there were cutting the pathway, each commanding a straight, steep piece of the ascent, and overhanging each gate was a gallery secure from arrow-shot, yet so contrived that great stones could be hurled through holes in the floor of it, in such a manner that they must irretrievably smash to a pulp any men advancing against it from below and in caves dug out from the rock on either hand was a great hoard of these stones, so that no enemy through sheer expenditure of troops could hope to storm a gate by exhausting its ammunition. But though there were eight of these granite gates in the series, we had the whole number to depend on no longer. The lowest gate was held by a garrison of Foranese's troops, who had built a wall above them to protect their occupation. The gate had been gained by no brilliant feat of arms, it had been won by threats, bribery, and promises, or, in other words, it had been given up by the blackest treachery. And there lay the keynote of the weakness in our defence. 
the most perfect ramparts that brain can invent are useless without men to line them, and it was men we lacked. Of students entering into the colleges of the Sacred Mountain there had been none now for many a year. The younger generation thought little of the older gods. Of the men that had grown up amongst the sacred groves and filled offices there, many had become lukewarm in their faith and remained on only through habit, and because an easy living stayed near them there and these, when the siege began, quickly made their way over to the other side. For Anise was no fool to fight against unnecessary strength. Her heralds made proclamation that peace and a good subsistence would be given to those who chose to come out to her willingly, and as an alternative she would kill by torture and mutilation those she caught in the place when she took it by storm, as she most assuredly would do before she had finished with it and so great was the prestige of her name that quite one half of these that remained on the mountain took themselves away from the defence. There was no attempt to hold back these sorry priests, nor was there any punishing them as they went. Zaman, indeed, was minded, so he told me with grim meaning himself, to give them some memento of their apostasy to carry away which would not wear out, but the others of the High Council made him stay his vengeful hand and so when I came to the place the garrison numbered no more than eighty, counting even feeble old dotards who could barely walk, and of men not past their prime I could barely command a score. Still, seeing the narrowness of the passages which led to each of the gates, up which in no place could more than two men advance together, we were by no means in desperate straits for the defence as yet. And if my new given kingdom was so far small, consisting, as it did in effect of the sacred mountain and no other part of Atlantis, at any rate there seemed little danger of its being further contracted. Another of the wise precautions of the men of old stood us in good stead then. In the ancient times, when grain first was grown as food, it came to be looked upon as the acme of wealth. Tribute was always paid from the people to their priests, and presently, so the old histories say, it was appointed that this should take the form of grain, as this was a medium both dignified and fitting. And those of the people who had it not were forced to barter their other produce for grain before they could pay this tribute. On the sacred mountain itself vast storehouses were dug in the rock, and here the grain was teemed in great yellow heaps, and each generation of those that were set over it took a pride in adding to the accumulation. In more modern days it had been a custom amongst the younger and more forward of the priests to scoff at this ancient provision, and to hold that a treasure of gold or weapons or jewels would have more value and no less of dignity. And more than once it has been a close thing lest these innovators should not be outvoted. But as it was, the old constitution had happily been preserved, and now in these years of trial the clan reaped the benefit. And so, with these granaries, and a series of great tanks and cisterns which held the rainfall, there was no chance of Foranice reducing our stronghold by mere close investment, even though she sat down stubbornly before it for a score of years. But it was the paucity of men for the defence which oppressed me most. As I took my way about the head of the mountain, inspecting all points, the emptiness of the place smote me like a succession of blows. The groves, once so trim, were now shaggy and unpruned. Wind had whirled the leaves in upon the temple floors, and they lay there unswept. The college of youths held no more now than a musty smell to bear witness that men had once been grown there. The homely palaces of the higher priests, at one time so ardently sought after, lay many of them empty, because not even one candidate came forward now to canvass for election. Evil thoughts surged up within me as I saw these things, that were direct promptings from the nether gods. "'There must be something wanting,' these tempters whispered, "'in a religion from which so many of its priests fled at the first pinch of persecution.' I did what I could to thrust these waverings resolutely behind me, but they refused to be altogether ousted from my brain, and so I made a compromise with myself. First. I would, with the help that might be given me, destroy this wanton Foranice, 
and regain the kingdom which had been given me to my own proper rule. And afterwards I would call a council of the seven and council of the three, and consider without prejudice if there was any matter in which our ancient ritual could be amended to suit the more modern requirements. But this should not be done till Foranice was dead and I was firmly planted in her room. I would not be a party, even to myself, to any plan which smacked at all of surrender. And there as I walked through the desolate groves and beside the cold altars, the high gods were pleased to show their approval of my scheme, and to give me opportunity to bind myself to it with a solemn oath and vow. At that moment from his distant resting-place in the east, our Lord the Sun leaped up to begin another day. For long enough from where I stood below the crest of the mountain, he himself would be invisible. But the great light of his glory spread far into the sky, and against it the arc of the mysteries loomed in black outline from the highest crag where it rested, lonely and terrible. For any one unauthorized to go nearer than a thousand paces to this storehouse of the highest mysteries meant instant death. On that day when I was initiated as one of the seven, I had been permitted to go near, at once press my lips against its ample curves. And the rank of my degree gave me the privilege to repeat that salute again once on each day when a new year was born. But what lay inside its great interior, and how it was entered, that was hidden from the seven, even as it was from the other priests and the common people in the city below. Only those who had been raised to the sublime elevation of the three had a knowledge of the dreadful powers which were stored within it. I went down on my knees where I was, and Zaman knelt beside me, and together we recited the prayers which had been said by the priests from the beginning of time, giving thanks to our great Lord that He has come to brighten another day. And then, with my eyes fixed on the black outline of the Ark of Mysteries, I vowed that, come what might, I at least would be true servant of the high gods to my life's end, and that my whole strength should be spent in restoring their worship and glory. End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 of the Lost Continent by C. J. Cutcliffe Hine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lost Continent by C. J. Cutcliffe Hine. Chapter 17 Nais the Regained. Now, from where we stood together just below the crest of the sacred mountain, we could see down into the city, which lay spread out below us like a map. The harbor and the great estuary gleamed at its farther side. The fringe of hills beyond smoked and fumed in their accustomed fashion. The great stone circle of our Lord the Sun stood up grim and bare in the middle of the city. And nearer in reared up the great mass of the royal pyramid, the gold on its sides catching new gold from the sun. There, too, in the square before the pyramid, stood the throne of granite, dwarfed by the distance to the size of a mole's hill, in which these nine years my love had lain sleeping. Old Zaman followed my gaze. "'Hi,' he said with a sigh. "'I know where your chief interest is. Deucalion, when he landed here new from Yucatan, was a strong man. The king whom we have chosen, and who is the best we have to choose, has his weakness. It can be turned into additional strength. Give me Nais here, living and warm to fight for, and I am a stronger man by far than the old cold viceroy and soldier that you speak about. I have passed my word to that already, and you shall have her, but at the cost of damaging somewhat this new kingdom of yours. Maybe, too, at the same time, we may rid you of this foreignese and her brood, but I do not think it likely. She is too wily, and once we begin our play she is likely to guess whence it comes, and how it will end, and so will make an escape before harm can reach her. The high gods, who have sent all these trials for our refinement, 
have seen fit to give her some knowledge of how these earth tremors may be set a-moving. I have seen her juggle with them. But may I hear your scheme? It will be shown you in good time enough. But for the present I would bid you sleep. It will be your part to go into the city tonight and take your woman, that is, my daughter, when she is set free, and bring her here as best you can. And for that you will need all a strong man's strength." He stepped back and looked me up and down. "'There are not many folk who would take you for the tidy, clean chin to kill you now, my brother. Your appearance will be a fine armor for you down yonder in the city tonight, when we wake it with our earth-shaking and terror. As you stand now, you are hairy enough and shaggy enough and naked enough and dirty enough for some wild savage new landed out of Europe. Have a care that no fine citizen down yonder takes a fancy to your thews and seizes upon you as a servant. I somewhat pity him in his household if he does." Old Zaman laughed. "'Why, come to think of it, so do I.' But quickly he got grave again. Laughter and Zaman were very rare playmates. Well, get you to bed, my king, and leave me to go into the Ark of Mysteries, and prepare there with another of the three the things that must be done. It is no light business to handle the tremendous powers which we must put into movement this night, and there is danger for us as there is for you. So if by chance we do not meet again till we stand up yonder behind the stars, giving account to the gods, fare you well, Deucalion. I slept that day as a soldier sleeps, taking full rest out of the hours, and letting no harassing thought disturb me. It is only the weak who permit their sleep to be broken on these occasions. And when the dark was well set, I roused and fetched those who should attend to the rope. Our Lady the Moon did not shine at that turn of the month, and the air was full of a great blackness. So I was out of sight all the while they lowered me. I reached the tumbled rocks that lay at the deep foot of the cliff, and then commenced to use a nice caution, because Foranisa soldiers squatted uneasily round their campfires, as though they had forebodings of the coming evil. I had no mind to further stir their wakefulness. So I crept swiftly along the darkest of the shadows, and at last came to the spot where that passage ends which before I had used to get beneath the walls of the city. The lamp was in place and I made my way along the winding swiftly. The air, so it seemed to me, was even more noxious with vapors than it had been when I was down there before, and I judged that Zaman had already begun to stir those internal activities which were shortly to convulse the city. But again I had difficulty in finding an exit, and this not because there were people moving about at the places where I had to come out, but because the set of the masonry was entirely changed. In olden times the priest's clan oversaw all the architect's plans, and ruled out anything likely to clash with their secret passages and chambers. But in this modern day the priests were of small account, and had no say in this matter, and the architects often through sheer blundering sealed up and made useless many of these outlets and hiding-places. As it was then, I had to get out of the network of tunnels and galleries where I could, and not where I would and in the event found myself at the farther side of the city, almost up to where the outer wall joins down to the harbor. I came out without being seen, careful even in this moment of extremity to preserve the ordinances, and closed all traces of exit behind me. The earth seemed to spring beneath my feet like the deck of a ship in smooth water, and though there was no actual movement as yet to disturb the people, and indeed these slept on in their houses and shelters without alarm, I could feel myself that the solid deadness of the ground was gone, and that any moment it might break out into devastating waves of movement. Gods, should I be too late to see the entombing of my love? Would she be laid there bare to the public gaze when presently the public swarmed out into the open spaces through fear at what the great earth tremor might cause to fall? I could see, in fancy, the rude, cruel hands thrust upon her as she lay there helpless and my inwards dried up at the thought. 
I ran madly down and down the narrow winding streets with one thought of coming to the square which lay in front of the royal pyramid before these things came to pass. With exquisite cruelty I had been forced with my own hands to place her alive in her burying-place beneath the granite throne. And if thews and speed could do it, I would not miss my reward of taking her forth again with the same strong hands. Few disturbed that furious hurry. At first, here and there, some wretch who had harbored in the gutter cried, A thief! Throw a share or I pursue! But if any of these followed, I did not know. At any rate, my speed then must have outdistanced anyone. Presently, too, as the swing of the earth underfoot became more keen, and the stonework of the buildings by the street side began to grate and groan and grit, that sent forth little showers of dust, people began to run with scared cries from out of their doors. But none of these had a mind to stop the ragged, shaggy, savage man who ran so swiftly past, and flung the mud from his naked feet. And so in time I came to the great square, and was there none too soon. The place was filling with people who flocked away from the narrow streets, and it was full of darkness and noise and dust and sickness. Beneath us the ground rippled in undulations like a sea, which with terrifying slowness grew more and more intense. Ever and again a house crashed down unseen in the gloom, and added to the tumult. But the great pyramid had been planned by its old builders to stand rude shocks. Its stones were dovetailed into one another with a marvelous cleverness, and were further clamped and joined by ponderous tongues of metal. It was a boast that one half the foundations could be dug from beneath it, and still the pyramid would stand four square under heaven, more enduring than the hills. Flickering torches showed that its great stone doors lay open, and ever again I saw some frightened inmates scurry out and then be lost to sight in the gloom. But with the royal pyramid and its ultimate fate I had little concern. I did not even care then whether Foranice was trapped or whether she came out sound and fit for further mischief. I crouched by the granite throne which stood in the middle of that splendid square, and heard its stones grate together like the ends of a broken bone as it rocked to the earth waves. In that night of dust and darkness it was hard to see the outline of one's own hand, but I think that the gods, in some requital for the love which had ached so long within me, gave me special power of sight. As I watched, I saw the great carved rock which formed the capstone of the throne move slightly and then move again, and then again, a tiny jerk for each earth pulse, but still there was an appreciable shifting. And, moreover, the stone moved always to one side. There was method in Zaman's desperate work, and this in my blind panic of love and haste I had overlooked. So I went up the steps of the throne on the side from which the great capstone was moving, and clung there afire with expectation. More and more violent did the earth swing grow, though the graduations of its increase could not be perceived, and the din of falling houses and the shrieks and cries of hurt and frightened people went louder up into the night. Thicker grew the dust that filled the air, till one coughed and strangled in the breathing, and more black did the night become as the dust rose and blotted the rare stars from sight. I clung to an angle of the granite throne, crouching on the uppermost step but one below the capstone, and could scarcely keep my place against the violence of the earth tremors. But still the huge capstone that was carved with the snake and the outstretched hand held my love fast locked in her living tomb, and I could have bit the cold granite at the impotence which barred me from her. The people who kept thronging into the square were mad with terror, but their very numbers made my case more desperate every moment. "'For a niece, goddess, aid us now!' some cried, and when the prayer did not bring them instant relief they fell to yammering out the old confessions of the faith which they had learned in childhood, turning in this hour of their dreadful need to those old gods which through so many dishonorable years they had spurned and deserted. It was a curious criticism on the balance of their real religion, if one had cared to make it. Louder grew the crash of falling masonry, and from the royal pyramid itself, though indeed I could not even see its outline through the darkness, there came sounds of grinding stones and cracking bars of metal, 
which told that even its superb majestic strength had a breaking strain. There came to my mind the threat that old Zaman had thundered forth in that painted, perfumed banqueting hall. "'You shall see!' he had cried to the Empress. "'This royal pyramid which you have polluted with your debaucheries, torn tier from tier, and stone from stone, and scattered as feathers spread before a wind!' Still heavier grew the surging of the earth, and the pavement of the great square gaped and upheaved, and the people who thronged it screamed still more shrilly as their feet were crushed by the grinding blocks. And now, too, the great pyramid itself was commencing to split, and gape and topple. The roofs of its splendid chambers gave way, and the ponderous masonry above shuddered down and filled them. In part, too, one could see the destruction now, and not guess at it merely from the fearful hearings of the darkness. Thunders had begun to roar through the black night above, and add their bellowings to this devil's orchestration of uproar, and livid lightning splashes lit the flying dust clouds. It was perhaps natural that she should be there, but it came as a shock when a flare of the lightning showed me Foranice safe out in the square, and indeed standing not far from myself. She had taken her place in the middle of a great flagstone, and stood there swaying her supple body to the shocks. Her face was calm, and its loveliness was untouched by the years. From time to time she brushed away the dust as it settled on the short red hair which curled about her neck. There was no trace of fear written upon her face. There was some weariness, some contempt, and I think a tinge of amusement. Yes, it took more than the crumbling of her royal pyramid to impress Foranice with the infinite powers of those she warred against. Gods! How the sight of her cruel indifference maddened me then! I had it in me to have strangled her with my hands if she had come within my reach. But, as it was, she stood in her place, swaying easily to the earth-waves as a sailor sways on a ship's deck and beside her, crouched on the same great flagstone and overcome with nausea, was Ilga, who again was raised to be her fangirl. It came to my mind that Ilga was twin sister to Nais, and that I owed her for an ancient kindness, but I had leisure to do nothing for her then, and indeed it was little enough I could have done. With each shock the great capstone of the throne to which I clung jarred farther and farther from its bed-place and my love was coming nearer to me. It was she who claimed all my service then. Once in their blind panic, a knot of the people in the square thought that the granite stone was too solid to be overturned, and saw in it an oasis of safety. They flocked towards it, many of them dragging themselves up the steep, deep high steps on hands and knees, because their feet had been injured by the billowing flagstones of the square but I was in no mood to have the place profaned by their silly tremblings and stares. I beat at them with my hands, tearing them away, and hurling them back down the steepness of the steps. They asked me what was my title to the place above their own, and I answered them with blows and gnashing teeth. I was careless as to what they thought me or who they thought me. I only wished them gone. And so they went wailing and crying that I was a devil of the night, for they had no spirit left to defend themselves. Farther and farther the great stone that made the top of the throne slid out from its bed, but its slowness of movement maddened me. A life's education left me in that moment, and I had no trace of stately patience left. In my puny fury I thrust at the great block with my shoulder and head, and clawed at it with my hands till the muscles rose on me in great ropes and knots, and the high gods must have laughed at my helplessness as they looked. All was being ordered by the three, who were their trusted servants, in their good time. The work of the gods may be done slowly, but it is done exceedingly sure. But at last, when all the people of the city were numb with terror and incapable of further emotion, save only for Forenis who still had nerve enough to show no concern, what had been threatened came to pass. The capstone of the throne slid out till it reached the balance, and the next shock threw it with a roar and a clatter to the ground. And then a strange tremor seized me. After all the scheming and effort, 
what I had so ardently prayed for had come about, but yet my inwards sank at the thought of mounting on the stone where I had mounted before, and taking my dear from the hollow where my hands had laid her. I knew for Anissa's vengefulness, and had a high value for her cleverness. Had she left Nais to lie in peace, or had she stolen her away to suffer indignities elsewhere? Or had she ended her sleep with death, and, as a grisly jest, left the corpse for my finding? I could not tell, I dared not guess. Never during a whole hard-fighting life have my emotions been so wrenched as they were at that moment. And, for excuse, it must be owned that love for Nais had sapped my hardihood over a matter in which she was so privately concerned. It began to come to my mind, however, that the infernal uproar of the earth tremor was beginning to slacken somewhat, as though Zaman knew he had done the work that he had promised, and was minded to give the wretched city a breathing space. So I took my fortitude in hand and clambered up onto the flat of the stone. The lightning flashes had ceased and all was darkness again and stifling dust, but at any moment the sky might be lit once more, and if I were seen in that place, shaggy and changed though I might be, Foranice, if she were standing near, would not be slow to guess my name and errand. So changed was I for the moment that I will finally confess that the idea of a fight was loathsome to me then. I wanted to have my business done and get gone from the place. With hands that shook, I fumbled over the face of the stone and found the clamps and bars of metal still in position where I had clenched them, and then reverently I let my fingers pass between these, and felt the curves of my love's body in its rest beneath. An exultation began to whirl within me. I did not know if she had been touched since I last left her. I did not know if the drug would have its due effect, and let her be awakened to warmth and sight again. But, dead or alive, I had her there, and she was mine, 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 and I could have yelled aloud in my joy at her possession. Still the earth shook beneath us, and masonry roared and crashed into ruin. I had to cling to my place with one hand whilst I unhasped the clamps of metal that made the top of her prison with the other but at last I swung the upper half of them clear, and those which pinned down her feet I let remain. I stooped and drew her soft body up onto the flat of the stone beside me, and pressed my lips a hundred times to the face I could not see. Some mad thought took me, I believe, that the mere fierceness and heat of my kisses would bring her back again to life and wakefulness. Indeed, I will own plainly that I did but sorry credit to my training and calmness that night but she lay in my arms cold and nerveless as a corpse, and by degrees my sober wits returned to me. This was no place for either of us. Let the earth's tremors cease, as was plainly threatened, let daylight come, and let a few of these nerveless people round recover from their panic, and all the great cost that had been expended might be counted as waste. We should be seen, and it would not be long before someone put a name to Nais and then it would be an easy matter to guess at Deucalion under the beard and the shaggy hair and the browned nakedness of the savage who attended on her. Tell a fright? By the gods! I was scared as the veriest trembler who blundered amongst the dust-clouds that night when the thought came to me. With all that ruin spread around, it would be hopeless to think that any of those secret galleries which tunneled under the ground would be left unbroken and so it was useless to try a passage under the walls by the old means. But I had heard shouts from the frightened mob which came to me through the din and the darkness that gave another idea for escape. "'The city is accursed!' they had cried. "'If we stay here it will fall on us. Let us go outside the walls where there are no buildings to bury us.' If they went I could not see. But one gate lay nearest to the royal pyramid, and I judged that in their panic they would not go farther than was needful. So I put the body of Nais over my shoulder, to leave my right arm free, and blundered off as best I could through the stifling darkness. It was hard to find a direction. It was hard to walk in the inky darkness over ground that was tossed and tumbled like a frozen sea. And as the earth still quaked and heaved, it was hard also to keep a footing. 
but if I did fall myself a score of times, my dear Burton got no bruise, and presently I got to the skirts of the square and found a street I knew. The most venomous part of the shaking was done, and no more buildings fell, but enough lay sprawled over the roadway to make walking into a climb, and the sweat rolled from me as I labored along my way. There was no difficulty about passing the gate. There was no gate. There was no wall. The gods had driven their plow through it, and it lay flat, and proud Atlantis stood as defenseless as the open country. Though I knew the cause of this ruin, though, in fact, I had myself in some measure incited it, I was almost sad at the ruthlessness with which it had been carried out. The royal pyramid might go, houses and palaces might be leveled, and for these I cared little enough. But when I saw those stately ramparts also filched away, there the soldier in me woke, and I grieved at this humbling of the mighty city that once had been my only mistress. But this was only a passing regret, a mere touch of the fighting man's pride. I had a different love now, that had wrapped herself round me far deeper and more tightly, and my duty was towards her first and foremost. The night would soon be passed, and then dangers would increase. None had interfered with us so far, though many had jostled us as I clambered over the ruins. But this forbearance could not be reckoned upon for long. The earth tremors had almost died away, and after the panic and the storm, then comes the time for the spoiling. All men who were poor would try to seize what lay nearest to their hands, and those of higher station, and any soldiers who could be collected and still remain true to command, would ruthlessly stop and strip any man they saw making off with plunder. I had no mind to clash with these guardians of law and property, so I fled on swiftly through the night with my burden, using the unfrequented ways. And, crying to the few folk who did meet me, that the woman had the plague, and they would lend me the shelter of their house as ours had fallen. And so in time we came to the place where the rope dangled from the precipice, and after Nais had been drawn up to the safety of the sacred mountain, I put my leg in the loop of the rope and followed her. Now came what was the keenest anxiety of all. We took the girl and laid her on a bed in one of the houses, and there in the lit room for the first time I saw her clearly. Her beauty was drawn and pale. Her eyes were closed, but so thin and transparent had grown the lids that one could almost see the brown of the pupil beneath them. Her hair had grown to inordinate thickness and length, and lay as a cushion behind and beside her head. There was no flicker of breath, there was none of that pulsing of the body which denotes life, but still she had not the appearance of ordinary death. The Nais I placed nine long years before to rest in the hollow of the stone was a fine-grown woman, full-bosomed and well-boned. The Nais that remained for me was half her weight. The old Nais it would have puzzled me to carry for an hour. This was no burden to impede a grown man. In other ways, too, she had altered. The nails of her fingers had grown to such a great length that they were twisted in spirals and the fingers themselves and her hands were so waxy and transparent that the bony core upon which they were built showed itself beneath the flesh in plain dull outline. Her clay-cold lips were so white that one sighed to remember the full beauty of their carmen. Her shoulders and neck had lost their comely curves, and made bony hollows now in which the dust of entombment lodged black and thickly. Reverently I set about preparing those things which, if all went well, should restore her. I heated water and filled a bath, and tinctured it heavily with those essences of the life of beasts which the priests extract and store against times of urgent need and sickness. I laid her chin deep in this bath and sat beside it to watch, maintaining that bath at a constant blood heat. An hour I watched, two hours I watched, three hours and yet she showed no flicker of life. The heat of her body given her by the bath was the same as the heat of my own. But in the feel of her skin when I stroked it with my hand there was something lacking still. Only when our Lord the Sun rose for his day did I break off my watching, 
whilst I said the necessary prayer which is prescribed, and quickly returned again to the gloom of the house. I was torn with anxiety, and as the time went on and still no sign of life came back, the hope that had once been so high within me began to sicken and leave me downcast and despondent. From without came the din of fighting. Already Foranese had sent her troops to storm the passageway, and the priests who defended it were shattering them with volleys of rocks. But these sounds of war woke no pulse within me. If Nais did not wake, then the world for me was ended, and I had no spirit left to care who remained uppermost. The gods in their due time will doubtless smite me for this impiety, but I make a confession of it here on these sheets, having no mind to conceal any portion of this history for the small reason that it does me a personal discredit. But as the hours went on, and still no flicker of life came to lessen the dumb agony that racked me, I grew more venturesome, and added more essences to the bath, and drugs also, such as experience had shown, might wake the disused tissues into life. I watched on with staring eyes, rubbing her wasted body now and again, and always keeping the heat of the bath at a constant. From the first I had barred the door against all who would have come near to help me. With my own hands I had laid my love to sleep, and I could not bear that others should rouse her, if indeed roused she should ever be. But after those first offers no others came, and the snarl and din of fighting told me of what occupied them. It is hard to take note of small changes which occur with infinite slowness, when one is all the while on the tense watch, and high-strung though my senses were, I think there must have been some indication of returning life shown before I was keen enough to notice it. For of a sudden, as I gazed, I saw a faint rippling on the surface of the water of the bath. Gods! Would it come back again to my love at last, this life, this wakefulness? The ripple died out as it had come, and I stooped my head nearer to the bath, to try if I could see some faint heaving of her bosom, some small twitching of the limbs. No, she lay there still without even a flutter of movement. But as I watched, surely it seemed to my aching eyes that some tinge was beginning to warm that blank whiteness of skin. How I filled myself with that sight! The color was returning to her again beyond a doubt. Once more the dried blood was becoming fluid and beginning again to course in its old channels. Her hair floated out in the liquid of the bath like some brown tangle of the ocean weed and ever and again it twitched and eddied to some impulse which in itself was too small for the eye to see. She had slept for nine long years, and I knew that the wakening could be none of the suddenest. Indeed, it came by its own gradations, and with infinite slowness, and I did not dare do more to hasten it. Further drugs might very well stop eternally what those which had been used already had begun. So I sat motionless where I was, and watched the color come back, and the waxiness go, and even the fullness of her curves in some small measure return. And when growing strength gave her power to endure them, and she was racked with those pains which were inevitable to being born back again in this fashion to life, I too felt the reflex of her agony, and writhed in loving sympathy. Still further, too, was I wrung by a torment of doubt, as to whether life or these rackings would in the end be conqueror. After each paroxysm the color ebbed back from her again, and for a while she would lie motionless. But strength and power seemed gradually to grow, and at last these prevailed, and drove death and sleep beneath them. Her eyelids struggled with their fastenings, her lips parted and her bosom heaved. With shivering gasps her breath began to pant between her reddening lips. At first it rattled dryly in her throat, but soon it softened and became more regular, and then with a last effort her eyes, her glorious loving eyes, slowly opened. I leaned over and called her softly by name. Her eyes met mine, and a glow arose from their depths that gave me the greatest joy I have met in all the world. To Calian, my love, she whispered, oh, my dear! so you have come for me. 
How I have dreamed of you! How I have been racked! But it was worth it all for this. End of chapter 17「Eighteen of the Lost Continent. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lost Continent by C. J. Cutcliffe Hine. Chapter 18 Storm of the Sacred Mountain. It was Nais herself who sent me to attend to my sterner duties. The din of the attack came to us in the house where I was tending her, and she asked its meaning. As pithily as might be, for she was in no condition for tedious listening, I gave her the history of her nine years' sleep. The color flushed more to her face. "'My lord is the properest man in all the world to be king,' she whispered. I refused to touch the trade till they had given me the queen I desired, safe and alive, here upon the mountain. How we poor women are made the chattels of you men! But for myself, I seem to like the traffic well enough. You should not have let me stand in the way of Atlantis good, Deucalion. Still, it is very sweet to know you were weak there for once, and that I was the cause of your weakness. What is that bath over yonder? Ah, I remember. My wits seem none of the clearest just now. You have made the beginning. Your strength will return to you by quick degrees, but it will not bear hurrying. You must have a patience. Your ear, sir, for one moment, and then I will rest in peace. My poor looks, are they all gone? You seem to have no mirror here. I had visions that I should wake up wrinkled and old. You are as you were, dear, that first night I saw you, the most beautiful woman in all the world. I am pleased you like me," she said, and took the cup of broth I offered her. My hair seems to have grown, but it needs combing sadly. I had a fancy, dear, once, that you liked ruddy hair best, and not a plain brown. She closed her eyes then, lying back amongst the cushions where I had placed her, and dropped off into a healthy sleep, with the smile still playing upon her lips. I put the coverlet over her and kissed her lightly, holding back my beard lest it should sweep her cheek. And then I went out of the chamber. That beard had grown vastly disagreeable to me these last hours, and then I went into a room in the house and found instruments, and shaved it down to the bare chin. A change of robe also I found there, and took it instead of my squalid rags. If a man is in truth a king, he owes these things to the dignity of his office. But if the din of the fighting was any guide, mine was a narrowing kingdom. Every hour it seemed to grow fiercer and more near, and it was clear that some of the gates in the passage up the cleft in the cliff, impregnable though all men had thought them, had yielded to the vehemence of Foranice's attack. And indeed it was scarcely to be marveled at with all her genius spurred on to fury by the blow that had been struck at her by wrecking so fair a part of the city, the Empress would be no light adversary, even for a strong place to resist, and the sacred mountain was no longer strong. Defences of stone, cunningly planned and mightily built, it still possessed, but these will not fight alone. They need men to line them, and moreover, abundance of men. For always in a storm of this kind, some desperate fellows will spit at death and get to hand-grips, or slingers and archers slip in their shot, or the throwing fire gets home, or, as here, some new-fangled machine like Foranice's fire-tubes, make one in a thousand of their wavering darts find the life. And so, though the general attacking loses his hundreds, the defenders also are not without their dead. The slaughter, as it turned out, had been prodigious as fast as the stormers came up. The priests who held the lowest gate remaining to us rained down great rocks upon them till the narrow alley of the stair was paved with their writhing dead. But Foranice stood on a spur of the rock below them urging on the charges, 
and with an insane valor company after company marched up to hurl themselves hopelessly against the defenses. They had no machines to batter the massive gates, and their attack was as pathetically useless as that of a child who hammers against a wall with an orange, and meanwhile the terrible stones from above mowed them down remorselessly. Company after company of the troops marched into this terrible death-trap, and not a man of all of them ever came back. Nor was it for Anissa's policy that they should do so. In her lust for this final conquest, she was minded to pour out troops till she had filled up the passes with the slain, so that at last she might march on to a level fight over the bridge of their poor bodies. It was no part of Foranice's mood ever to count the cost. She set down the object which was to be gained, and it was her policy that the people of Atlantis were there to gain it for her. Two gates, then, had she carried in this dreadful fashion, slaughtering those priests that stood behind, them who had not been already shot down. And here I came down from above to take my share in the fight. There was no trumpet to announce my coming no herald to proclaim my quality, but the priests, as a sheer custom, picked up to Kalian as a battle-cry, and some shouted that, with a king to lead, there would be no further ground lost. It was clear that the name carried to the other side, and bore weight with it. A company of poor, doomed wretches who were hurrying up stopped in their charge. The word to Kalian was bandied round and handed back down the line. I thought with some grim satisfaction that here was evidence I was not completely forgotten in the land. There came shouts to them from behind to carry on their advance, but they did not budge. And presently a glittering officer panted up, and commenced to strike right and left amongst them with his sword. From where I stood on the high rampart above the gate I could see him plainly, and recognized him at once. It matters not what they use for their battle-cry," he was shouting. You have the orders of your divine empress, and that is enough. You should be proud to die for her wish, you cowards, and if you do not obey, you will die afterwards under the instruments of the tormentors, very painfully. As for Deucalion, he is dead any time these nine years." "'There, it seems, you lie, my lord Tatho,' I shouted down to him. He started and looked up at me. So, you are there in real truth, then. Well, old comrade, I am sorry, but it is too late to make a composition now. You are on the side of these mangy priests, and the Empress has made an edict that they are to be rooted out, and I am her most obedient servant. You used to be skillful of fence, I said, and indeed there was little enough to choose between us. If it please you to stop this pitiful killing, make yourself the champion of your side, and I will stand for mine, and we will fight out this quarrel in some fair place, and bind our parties to abide by the result. It will be a grand fight between us two, old friend, and it goes hard with me to balk you of it. But I cannot pleasure you. I am general here under Foranice, and she has given me the strongest orders not to peril myself. And besides, though you are a great man, Deucalion, you are not chief. You are not even one of the three. I am king. Tatho laughed. Few but yourself would say so, my lord. Few, truly. But what there are, they are powerful. I was given the name for the first time yesterday, and as a first blow in the campaign there was some mischief done in the city. I was there myself, and saw how you took it. You were in Atlantis. I went for Nais. She is on the mountain now, and tomorrow will be my queen. Tatho, as a priest to a priest, let me solemnly bring to your memory the infinite power you bite against on this sacred mountain. Your teaching has warned you of the weapons that are stored in the Ark of the Mysteries. If you persist in this attack, at the best you can merely lose. At the worst, you can bring about a wreck over which even the high gods will shudder as they order it." "'You cannot scare us back now by words,' said Tatho doggedly. "'And as for magic, it will be met by magic. Foranice has found by her own cleverness as many powers as were ever stored up in the Ark of the Mysteries.' 
Yet she looked on helplessly enough last night when her royal pyramid was trundled into a rubbish heap. Zaman had prophesied that this should be so, and for a witness, why, I myself stood closer to her than we two stand now and saw her. I will own you took her by surprise somewhat there. I do not understand these matters myself. I was never more than one of the seven in the old days, and now, quite rightly, for a niece keeps the knowledge of her magic to herself. But it seems time is needed when one magic is to be met by another. Well, I said, I know little about the business either. I leave these matters now to those who are higher above me in the priesthood. Indeed, having a liking for Nais, it seems I am debarred from ever being given understanding about the highest of the higher mysteries. So I content myself with being a soldier, and when the appointed day comes, I shall fall and kiss my mother the earth for the last time. You, so I am told, have ambition for longer life." He nodded. Foranese has found the great secret, and I am to be the first that will share it with her. We shall be as gods upon the earth, seeing that death will be powerless to touch us. And the twin son she has borne me will be made immortal also. Foranese is headstrong. No, my lord. There is no need to shake your head and try to deny it. I have had some acquaintance with her. But the order has been made, and her immortality will be snatched from her very rudely. Now, mark solemnly my words. I, Deucalion, have been appointed King of Atlantis by the High Council of the Priests, who are the mouthpiece of the Most High Gods, and if I do not have my reign, then there will be no Atlantis left to carry either king or empress. You know me, Tatho, for a man that never lies." He nodded. "'Then save yourself before it is too late. You shall have again your viceroyalty in Yucatan.' "'But, man, there is no Yucatan. A great horde of little hairy creatures that were something less than human and something more than beasts swept down upon our cities and ate them out. Oh, you may sneer if you choose. Others sneered when I came home till the Empress stopped them. But you know what a train of driver ants is that you meet within the forests? You may light fires across their path and they will march into them in their blind bravery and put them out with their bodies, and those that are left will march on in an unbroken column and devour all that stands in their path. I tell you, my lord, those little hairy creatures were like the ants. Aye, for numbers and wooden bravery as well as for appetite. As a result, today there is no Yucatan. You shall have Egypt, then. He burst at me hotly. I would not take seven Egypts and ten Yucatans. My lord, you think more poorly of me than is kind when you ask me to become a traitor. In your place, would you throw your Nais away if the doing it would save you from a danger? That is different. In no degree. You have a kindness for her, I have all that and more for Foranice, who is, besides, my wife and the mother of my children. If I have qualms, and I freely confess I know you are desperate men up there and have dreadful powers at your command, my shiverings are for them and not for myself. But I think, my lord, this parley is leading to nothing, and though these common soldiers here will understand little enough of our talk, they may be picking up a word here and there, and I do not wish them to go on to their death, as you will see them do shortly, and carry evil reports about me to whatever gods they chance to come before." He saluted me with his sword and drew back, and once more the missiles began to fly, and the doomed wretches, who had been halting beside the steep rock walls of the pass, began once more to press hopelessly forward. They had scaling ladders, certainly but they had no chance of getting these planted. They could do naught but fill the narrow way with their bodies, and to that end they had been sent, and to that end they humbly died. Our priests with crow and lever wrenched from their lodging-places the great rocks which had been made ready, and sent them crashing down, so that once more screams filled the pass and the horrid butchery was renewed. 
But ever and again some arrow or some slingstone or some fire-tube's dart would find its way up from below and through the defences, and there we would be with a man the less to carry on the fight. It was well enough for Foranese to be lavish with her troops. Indeed, if she wished for success, there were no two ways for it. And when those she had levied were killed, she could readily press others into the service, seeing that she had the whole broad face of the country under her rule. But with us it was different. A man down on our side was a man whose arm would bitterly be missed, and one which could in no possible way be replaced. I made calculation of the chances, and saw clearly that, if we continued the fight on the present plan, they would storm the gates one after another as they came to them, and that by the time the uppermost gate was reached there would be no priest alive to defend it. And so, not disdaining to fashion myself on Foranice's newer plan, which held that a general should at times, in preference, plot coldly from a place of some safety, and not lead the thick of the fighting. I left those who stood to the gate with some rough soldiers' words of cheer, and withdrew again up the narrow stair of the pass. This one approach to the sacred mountain was, as I have said before, vastly more difficult and dangerous in the olden days when it stood as a mere bare cleft as the high gods made it. But a chasm had been bridged here, a shelf cut through the solid rock there, and in many places the roadway was built up on piers from distant crags below, so as to make all uniform and easy. It came to my mind now that, if I could destroy this path, we might gain a breathing space for further effort. The idea seemed good, or at least no other occurred to me which would in any way relieve our desperate situation, and I looked around me for means to put it into execution. Up and down, from the mountain to the plains below, I had traversed that narrow stair of a pass some thousands of times, and so, in a manner of speaking, knew every stone and every turn and every cut of it by heart. But I had never looked upon it with an eye to shaving off all roadway to the sacred mountain, and so now, even in this moment of dreadful stress, I had to traverse it no less than three times afresh before I could decide upon the best site for demolition. But once the point was fixed, there was little delay in getting the scheme in movement. Already I had sent men to the storehouses amongst the priest's dwellings to fetch me rams and crows and acids and hammers, and such other material as was needed, and these stood handy behind one of the upper gates. I put on every pair of hands that could be spared to the work, no matter what was their age and feebleness. Yes, if Nais could have walked so far, I would have pressed her for the labor. And presently, carved balustrade and wayside statue, together with the lettered wallstones and the foot-worn cobbles, roared down into the gulf below, and added their din to the shrieks and yells and crashes of the fighting. Gods, but it was a hateful task, smashing down that splendid handiwork of the men of the past. But it was better that it should crash down to ruin in the abyss below, than that Foranice should profane it with her impious sandals. At first, I had feared that it would be needful to sacrifice the knot of brave men who were so valiantly defending the gate then being attacked. It is disgusting to be forced into a measure of this kind, but in hard warfare it is often needful to the carrying out of his schemes for a general to leave a part of his troops to fight to a finish, and without hope of rescue, as valiantly as they may, and all he can do for their reward is to recommend them earnestly to the care of the gods. But when the work of destroying the pathway was nearly completed, I saw a chance of retrieving them. We had not been content merely with breaking arches and throwing down the piers. We had got our rams and levers under the living rock itself on which all the whole fabric stood, and fire stood ready to heat the rams for their work, and when the word was given, the whole could be sent crashing down the face of the cliffs beyond chance of repair. All was, I say, finally prepared in this fashion, and then I gave the word to hold. A narrow ledge still remained undestroyed and offered footway, and over this I crossed. The cut we had made was immediately below the uppermost gate of all, and below it there were three more massive gates still unviolated, besides the one then being so vehemently attacked. Already the garrisons had been retired from these 
and I passed through them all in turn, unchallenged and unchecked, and came to that busy rampart where the twelve priests left alive worked, stripped to the waist at heaving down the murderous rocks. For a while I busied myself at their side, stopping an occasional fire-tube dart or arrow on my shield and passing them the tidings. The attack was growing fiercer every minute now. The enemy had packed the pass below well nigh full of their dead, and our battering stones had less distance to fall and so could do less execution. They pressed forward more eagerly than ever with their scaling ladders, and it was plain that soon they would inevitably put the place to the storm. Even during the short time I was there, their sling-stones and missiles took life from three more of the twelve who stood with me on the defence. So I gave the word for one more furious avalanche of rock to be pelted down, and whilst the few living were crawling out from those killed by the discharge, and whilst the next band of reinforcements came scrambling up over the bodies, I sent my nine remaining men away at a run up the steep stairway of the path, and then followed them myself. Each of the gates in turn we passed, shutting them after us, and breaking the bars and levers with which they were moved. And not till we were through the last did the roar of shouts from below tell that the besiegers had found the gate they bid against was deserted. One by one we balanced our way across the narrow ledge which was left where the path had been destroyed, and one poor priest that carried a wound grew giddy and lost his balance here and toppled down to his death in the abyss below before a hand could be stretched out to steady him. And then, when we were all over, heat was put to the rams, and they expanded with their resistless force and tore the remaining ledges from their hold in the rock. I think a pang went through us all then when we saw for ourselves the last connecting link cut away from between the poor remaining handful of our sacred clan on the mountain and the rest of our great nation who had grown so bitterly estranged to us below. But here, at any rate, was a break in the fighting. There were no further preparations we could make for our defence, and high though I knew Foranisa's genius to be, I did not see how she could very well do other than accept the check and retire. So I set a guard on the ramparts of the uppermost gate to watch all possible movements, and gave the word to the others to go and find the rest which so much they needed. For myself, dutifully, I tried to find Zaman first, going on the errand my proper self, for there was little enough of kingly state observed on the sacred mountain, although the name and title had been given me. But Zaman was not to be come at. He was engaged inside the Ark of the Mysteries with another of the three, and being myself only one of the seven, I had not rank enough in the priesthood to break in upon their workings and so I was free to turn where my likings would have led me first, and that was to the house which sheltered Nais. She waked as I came in over the threshold, and her eyes filled with a welcome for me. I went across and knelt where she lay, putting my face on the pillow beside her. She was full of tender talk and sweet endearments. Gods! What an infinity of delight I had missed by not knowing my Nais earlier! But she had a will of her own through it all, and some quaint conceits which made her all the more adorable. She rallied me on the new cleanness of my chin, and on the robe which I had taken as a covering. She professed a pretty awe for my kingship, and vowed that had she known of my coming dignities she would never have dared to discover a love for me. But about my marriage with Foranice she spoke with less lightness. She put out her thin white hand and drew my face to her lips. It is weak of me to have a jealousy, she murmured, knowing how completely my lord is mine alone, but I cannot help it. You have said you were her husband for a while. It gives me a pang to think that I shall not be the first to lie in your arms, Deucalion. Then you may gaily throw your pang away, I whispered back. I was husband to Foranice in mere word, for how long I do not precisely know but in anything beyond I was never her husband at all. She married me by a form she prescribed herself, ignoring all the old rites and ceremonies, and whether it would hold as legal or not we need not trouble to inquire. She herself has most nicely and completely annulled that marriage as I have told you. Tatho is her husband now, and father to her children, and he seems to have a fondness for her which does him credit. 
We said other things, too, in that chamber, those small repetitions of endearments which are so precious to lovers, and so beyond the comprehension of other folk, but they are not to be set down on these sheets. They are a mere private matter, which can have no concern to any one beyond our two selves, and more weighty subjects are piling themselves up in deep index for the historian. For Anise, it seemed, had more rage against the priest's clan on the mountain and more bright genius to help her to a vengeance than I had credited. Her troops stormed easily the gates we had left to them, and swarmed up till they stood where the pathway was broken down. In the fierceness of their rush, the foremost were thrust over the brink by those pressing up behind before the advance could be halted, and these went screaming to a horrid death in the great gulf below. But it was no position here that a lavish spending of men could take, and presently all were drawn off, save for some half-score who stood as outpost sentries, and dodged out of arrow-shot behind angles of the rock. It seems, too, that the Empress herself reconnoitred the place, using due caution and quickness, and so got for herself a full plan of its requirements, without being obliged to trust the measuring of another eye. With extraordinary nimbleness she must have planned an engine such as was necessary to suit her purposes, and given orders for its making. For even with the vast force and resources at her disposal, the speed with which it was built was prodigious. There was very little noise made to tell of what was afoot. All the woodwork and metalwork was cut and tongued and forged, and fitted first by skilled craftsmen below, in the plain at the foot of the cleft. And when each ponderous balk and each crosspiece and each plank was dragged up the steep pass through the conquered gates, it was ready instantly for fitting into its appointed place in the completed machine. The cleft was straight where they set about their building, and there was no curve or spur of the cliff to hide their handiwork from those of the priests who watched from the ramparts above our one remaining gate. But Fornice had a coyness lest her engine should be seen before it was completed, and so to screen it she had a vast fire built at the uppermost point where the causeway was broken off, and fed diligently with wet sedge and green wood, so that a great smoke poured out, rising like a curtain that shut out all view. And so, though the priests on the rampart above the gate picked off now and again some of those who tended the fire, they could do the besiegers no further injury, and remained up to the last quite in ignorance of their tactics. The passage up the cleft was in shadow during the night hours, for, though all the crest of the sacred mountain was always lit brightly by the eternal fires which made its defense on the farther side, there glowed through no gleam down that flank where the cliff ran sheer to the plains beneath. And so it was under cover of the darkness that Fornice brought up her engine into position for attack. Planking had been laid down for its wheels, and the wheels themselves well greased, and it may be that she hoped to march in upon us whilst all slept. But there was a certain creaking and groaning of timbers, and labored panting of men, which gave advertisement that something was being attempted, and the alarm was spread quietly in the hope that, if a surprise had been planned, the real surprise might be turned the other way. A messenger came running to me where I sat in the house at the side of my love, and she, like the soldier's wife she was made to be, kissed me and bade me go quickly and care for my honor, and bring back my wounds for her to mend. On the rampart above the gate all was silence, save for the faint rustle of armed men, and out of the black darkness ahead and from the other side of the broken causeway came the sounds of which the messenger had warned me. The captain of the gate came to me and whispered, "'We have made no light till the king came, not knowing the king's will in the matter. Is it wished I should send some of the throwing fire down yonder, on the chance that it does some harm and at the same time lights up the place? Or is it willed that we wait for their surprise?" "'Send the fire,' I said, or we may find that Foranice's brain has been one too many for us." The captain of the gate took one of the balls in his hand, lit the fuse and hurled it. The horrid thing burst amongst a mass of men who were laboring with a huge engine sputtering them with its deadly fire, and lighting their garments. The plan of the engine showed itself plainly. They had built them a vast great tower, resting on wheels at its base, so that it might be pushed forward from behind, 
and slanting at its foot to allow for the steepness of the path and leave it always upright. It was storied inside, with ladders joining each floor, and through slits in the side which faced us bowmen could cover an attack. From its top a great bridge reared high above it, being carried vertically till the tower was brought near enough for its use. The bridge was hinged at the third story of the tower, and fastened with ropes to its extreme top. But once the ropes were cut, the bridge would fall, and light upon whatever came within its swing, and be held there by the spikes with which it was studded beneath. I saw, and inwardly, felt myself conquered. The cleverness of Foranis had been too strong for my defence. No war-engine of which we had command could overset the tower. The whole of its massive timbers were hung with the wet, new-stripped skins of beasts, so that even the throwing-fire could not destroy it. What puny means we had to impede those who pushed it forward would have little effect. Presently it would come to the place appointed, and the ropes would be cut and the bridge would thunder down on the rampart above our last gate, and the stormers would pour out to their final success. Well, life had loomed very pleasant for me these few days with a warm and loving Nais once more in touch of my arms. But the high gods in their infinite wisdom knew best always, and I was no rebel to stay stiff-necked against their decision. But it is ever a soldier's privilege, come what may, to warm over a fight, and the most exquisitely fierce joy of all is that final fight of a man who knows that he must die and who lusts only to make his bed of slain high enough to carry a due memory of his powers with those who afterwards come to gaze upon it. I gripped my axe, and the muscles of my arm stood out in knots at the thought of it. Would Tatho come to give me sport? I feared not. They would send only the common soldiers first to the storm, and I must be content to do my killing on those. And Nais, what of her? I had a quiet mind there. When any spoilers came to the house where she lay, she would know that Deucalion had been taken up to the gods, and she would not be long in following him. She had her dagger. No, I had no fears of being parted long from Nais now. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of The Lost Continent this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lost Continent by C. J. Cutcliffe Hine. Chapter 19 Destruction of Atlantis. A tottering old priest came up and touched me on the shoulder. Well, I said sharply, having small taste for interruption just now. News has been carried to the three, my king, of what is threatened. Then they will know that I stand here now, brother, to enjoy the finest fight of my life. When it is finished, I shall go to the gods, and be there standing behind the stars to welcome them when presently they also arrive. They have my regrets that they are too old and too feeble to die and look upon a fine killing themselves. I have commands from them, my king, to lay upon you which I fear you will like but slenderly. You are forbidden to find your death here in the fighting. They have a further use for you yet." I turned on the old man angrily enough. "'I shall take no such order, my brother. I am not going to believe it was ever given. You must have misunderstood. If I am a man, if I am a priest, if I am a soldier, if I am a king, then it stands to my honour that no enemy should pass this gate whilst yet I live, and you may go back and throw that message at their teeth." The old man smiled enviously. He too had been a keen soldier in his day. "'I told them you would not easily believe such a message, and asked them for a sign, and they bore with me and gave me one. I was to give you this jewel, my king.' "'How came they by that? It is a bracelet from the elbow of Nais. They must have stripped her of it. I did not know what came from Nais. The word I was to bring you said that the owner of the jewel was inside the Ark of the Mysteries and waited you there. 
the use which the three have for you further concerns her also. Even when I heard that, I will freely confess that my obedience was sorely tried, and I have the less shame in setting it down on these sheets, because I know that all true soldiers will feel a sympathy for my plight. Indeed, the promise of the battle was very tempting. But in the end my love for Nais prevailed, and I gave the salutation that was needful in token that I heard the order and obeyed it. To the knot of priests who were left for the defence I turned and made my farewells. "'You will have what I shall miss, my brothers,' I said. "'I envy you that fight. But though I am king of Atlantis, still I am only one of the seven, and so am the servant of the three and must obey their order. They speak in words the will of the Most High Gods, and we must do as they command. You will stand behind the stars before I come, and I ask of you that you will commend me to those you meet there. It is not my own will that I shall not appear there by your side." They heard my words with smiles, and very courteously saluted me with their weapons, and there we parted. I did not see the fight, but I know it was good, from the time which passed before Foranice's hordes broke out onto the crest of the mountain. They died hard, that last remnant of the lesser priests of Atlantis. With a sour enough feeling I went up to the head of the pass, and then through the groves and between the temples and colleges and houses which stood on the upper slopes of the sacred mountain, till I reached that boundary beyond which in milder days it was death for any but the privileged few to pass. But the time, it appeared to me, was past for conventions, and, moreover, my own temper was hot and it is likely that I should have strown on with little scruple if I had not been interrupted. But in the temple which marked the boundary there was old Zaman waiting. And he, with due solemnity of words and with the whole of some ancient ritual ordained for that purpose, sought dispensation from the high gods for my trespass, and would not give me way till he was through with his ceremony. Already Foranice's tower and bridge were in position, for the clash and yelling of a fight told that the small handful of priests on the rampart of the last gate were bartering their lives for the highest return in dead that they could earn. They were trained fighting men all, but old and feeble, and the odds against them were too enormous to be stemmed for overlong. In a very short time the place would be put to the storm, and the roof of the sacred mountain would be at the open mercy of the invader. If there was any further thing to be done, it was well that it should be set about quickly whilst peace remained. It seemed to me that the moment for prompt action and the time for lengthy pompous ceremonial was done for good. But Zaman was minded otherwise. He led me up to the Ark of the Mysteries and chided my impatience, and waited till I had given it my reverential kiss, and then he called aloud, and another old man came out of the opening which is in the top of the Ark and climbed painfully down by the battens which are fixed on its sides. He was a man I had never seen before, hoary, frail, and emaciated, and he and Zaman were then the only two remaining priests who had been raised to the highest degree known to our clan, and who alone had the knowledge of the highest secrets and powers and mysteries. "'Look!' cried Zaman in his shrill old voice, and swept a trembling finger over the shattered city and the great spread of sea and country which lay in view of us below. I followed his pointing and looked, and a chill began to crawl through me. All was plainly shown. Our Lord the Sun burned high overhead in a sky of cloudless blue, and day shimmered in his heat. All below seemed from that distance peaceful and warm and still, save only that the mountains smoked more than ordinary and some spouted fires and that the sea boiled with some strange disorder. But it was the significance of the sea that troubled me most. Far out on the distant coast it surged against the rocks in enormous rolls of surf, and up the great estuary, at the head of which the city of Atlantis stands, it gushed in successive waves of enormous height which never returned. Already the lower lands on either side were blotted out beneath tumultuous waters, the harbour walls were drowned out of sight, and the flood was creeping up into the lower wards of the great city itself. "'You have seen?' asked Zaman. "'I have seen. You understand?' 
in part. Then let me tell you all. This is the beginning, and the end will follow swiftly. The most high gods that sit behind the stars have a limit to even their sublime patience, and that has been passed. The city of Atlantis, the great continent that is beyond, and all that are in them are doomed to unutterable destruction. Of old it was foreseen that this great wiping out would happen through the sins of men, and to this end the Ark of the Mysteries was built under the direction of the gods. No mortal implements can so much as scratch its surface, no waves or rocks wreck it. Inside is stored on sheets of the ancient writing all that is known in the world of learning that is not shared by the common people. Also there is grain in a store, and sweet water in tanks sufficient for two persons for the space of four years, together with seeds, weapons, and all such other matters as were deemed fit. Out of all this vast country it has been decreed by the high gods that two shall not perish. Two shall be chosen, a man and a woman, who are fit and proper persons to carry away with them the ancient learning to dispose of it as they see best, and afterwards to rear up a race who shall in time build another kingdom and do honour to our Lord the Sun and the other gods in another place. The woman is within the ark already, and seated in the place appointed for her, and though she is a daughter of mine, the burden of her choosing is with you. For the man the choice has fallen upon yourself." I was numb with the shock of what was befalling. I do not know that I care to be a survivor. "'You are not asked for your wishes,' said the old man. "'You are given an order from the high gods, who know you to be their faithful servant.' Habit wrote strong upon me. I made salutation in the required form, and said that I heard and would obey. Then it remains to raise you to the sublime degree of the three, and if your learning is so small that you will not understand the keys to many of the powers and the highest of the mysteries when they are handed to you, that fault cannot be remedied now. Certainly the time remaining was short enough. The fight still raged down at the gate in the pass, though it was a wonder how the handful of priests had held their ground so long. But the ocean rolled in upon the land in an ever-increasing flood, and the mountains smoked and belched forth more volleys of rock as the weight increased on their lower parts, and presently those that besieged the mountain could not fail to see the fate that threatened them. Then there would be no withholding their rush. In their mad fury and panic they would sweep all obstruction restlessly before them, and those who stood in their path might look to themselves. But there was no hurrying Zaman and his fellow sage. They were without temple for the ceremony, without sacrifice or incense to decorate it. They had but the sky for a roof to make their echoes, and the gods themselves for witnesses. But they went through the work of raising me to their own degree, with all the grand and majestic form which has gathered dignity from the ages, and by no one sentence did they curtail it. A burning mountain burst with a bellowing roar as the incoming waters met its fires, but gravely they went on, in turn reciting their sentences. For Nisa's troops broke down the last resistance and poured in in a frenzied stream amongst the groves and temples, but still they quavered never in the ritual. It had been said that this ceremony is the grandest and the most impressive of all those connected with our holy religion, and certainly I found it so and I speak as one intimate with all the others. Even the tremendous circumstances which hemmed them in could do nothing to make these frail old men forget the deference which was due to the highest order of the clan. For myself I will freely own I was less rapt. I stood there bareheaded in the heat, a man trying to concentrate himself, and yet torn the while by a thousand foreign emotions. The awful thing that was happening all around compelled some of my attention. A continent was in the very act and article of meeting with complete destruction, and if Zaman and the other priests were strong enough to give their minds wholly up to a matter parochial to the priesthood, I was not so stoical. And moreover I was filled with other anxieties and thoughts concerning Nais. Yet 
I managed to preserve a decent show of attention to the ceremony, making all those responses which are required of me, and trying as well as might be to preserve in my mind those sentences which were the keys to power and learning, and not mere phrasings of grandeur and devotion. But it became clear that if the ceremony of my raising did not soon arrive at its natural end, it would be cut short presently with something of suddenness for Anissa's conquering legion swarmed out onto the crest of the mountain, and now carried full knowledge of the dreadful thing that was come upon the country. They were out of all control, and ran about like men distracted, but knowing full well that the priests would have brought this terrible wreck to pass by virtue of the powers which were stored within the Ark of the Mysteries, it would be their natural impulse to pour out a final vengeance upon any of these same priests they could come across before it was too late. It began to come to my mind that, if the ceremony did not very shortly terminate, the further part of the plan would stand very small chance of completion, and I should come by my death after all by fighting to a finish, as I had pictured to myself before. My flickering attention saw the soldiers coming always nearer in their frantic wanderings, and saw also the sea below rolling deeper and deeper in upon the land. The fires, too, which ringed in half the mountain, spurted up to double their old height, and burned with an unceasing roar. But for all distraction these things gave to the two old priests who were raising me, we might have been in the quietness of some ancient temple, with not so much as a fly to buzz an interruption. But at last an end came to the ceremony. "'Kneel!' cried Zaman, and make obeisance to your mothers the earth, and swear by the high gods that you will never make improper use of the powers over her which this day you have been granted. When I had done that, he bade me rise as a fully installed and duly initiated member of the three. You will have no opportunity to practice the workings of this degree with either of us, my brother, said he, for presently, our other brother and I go to stand before the gods to deliver to them an account of our trust, and of how we have carried it out. But what items you remember here and there may turn of use to you hereafter. And now we too give you our farewells, and promise to commend you highly to the gods when soon we meet them in their place behind the stars. Climb now into the ark, and be ready to shut the door which guards it, if there is any attempt by these raging people to invade that also. Remember, my brother, it is the gods' direct will that you and the woman Nais go from this place living and sound, and you are expressly forbidden to accept challenge or provocation to fight on any pretext whatever. But as long as may be done in safety, you may look out upon Atlantis in her death throes. It is very fitting that one of the only two who are sent hence alive should carry the full tale of what has befallen." I went to the top of the Ark of Mysteries then, climbing there by the battens which are fastened to the sides, and then descended by the stair which is inside and found Nais in a little chamber waiting for me. "'I was bidden stay here by Zaman, she said, who forced me to this place by threats and also by promises that my lord would follow. He is very ungentle, that father of mine, but I think he has a kindness for us both, and anyway, he is my father, and I cannot help loving him. Is there no chance to save him from what is going to happen? He will not come into this ark, for I asked him. It has been ordained from the ancient time when first the ark was built, that when the day for its purpose came, one woman and one man should be its only tenants, and they are here already. Zaman's will in the matter is not to be twisted by you or by me. He has a message to be delivered to the gods, and, if I know him at all, he grudges every minute that is lost in carrying it to them." I left her then, and went out again up the stair, and stood once more on the roof of the ark. On the mountaintop men still ran about distracted, but gradually they were coming to where the ark rested on the highest point. For the moment, however, I passed them lightly. The drowning of the great continent that had been spread out below filled the eye. Ocean roared in upon it with still more furious waves. The plains and the level lands were foaming lakes. The great city of Atlantis had vanished eternally. 
The mountains alone kept their heads above the flood, and spewed out rocks and steam and boiling stone, or burst when the waters reached them and created great whirlpools of surging sea and twisted trees and bubbling mud. In the space of a few breaths every living creature that dwelt in the lower grounds had been smothered by the waters, save for a few who huddled in a pair of galleys that were driven oarless inland, over what had once been black forest and hunting land for the beasts. And even as I watched, these also were swallowed up by the horrid turmoil of sea, and nothing but the sea-beasts, and those of the greater lizards which can live in such outrageous waters, could have survived even that state of the destruction. Indeed, none but those men who had now found standing-ground on the upper slopes of the sacred mountain survived, and it was plain that their span was short, for the great mass of the continent sank deeper and more deep every minute before our aching eyes, beneath the boiling inrush of the seas. But though the great mass of the soldiery were dazed and maddened at the prospect of the overwhelming which threatened them, there were some with a strength of mind too valiant to give any outward show of discomposure. Presently a compact little body of people came out from the houses and the temples, and headed directly across the open ground towards the ark. On the outside marched Foranice's personal guards with their weapons new-blooded. They had been forced to fight a way through their own fellow-soldiers. The poor demented creatures had thought it was every one for himself now, till these guards, by their mistress's order, proved to them that for a niece still came first. And in the middle of them, borne in a litter of gold and ivory by her grotesque European slaves, rode the empress, still calm, still lovely, and seemingly divided in her sentiments between contempt and amusement. Her two children lay in the litter at her feet. On her right hand marched Tatho gorgeously apparelled, and with a beard curled and plaited into a thousand ringlets. On the other side, plying her industry with unruffled defence, walked Ilga, once again fangirl, and so still second lady in this dwindling kingdom. The party of them halted half a score of paces from the ark by Foranice's order. "'Do not go near to those unclean old men. They carry a rank odour with them, and for the moment we are short of essences to sweeten the air of their neighbourhood. She lifted her eyebrows and looked up at me. Truly, a quiet little gathering of old acquaintances. Why, there is Deucalion, that once I took the flavour of and threw aside when he cloyed me. I have Nais here, I said, and presently we two will be all that are left alive of this nation. Nais is quite welcome to my leavings, she laughed. I will look down upon your country cooings when presently I go back to the place behind the stars from which I came. You are a very rustic person, Deucalion. They tell me, too, that three or four of these smelling old men up here have named you king. Did you swell much with dignity? Or did you remember that there was a pretty empress left that would still be empress so long as there was an Atlantis to govern? Come, sir, find your tongue. By my face, you must have hungered for me very madly these years we have been parted, if new-grown ruggedness of feature is an evidence. Have your jibe. I do not jibe back at a woman who presently will die. Bah! Deucalion, you will live behind the times. Have they not told you that I know the great secret, and am indeed a goddess now? My arts can make life run on eternally." Then the waters will presently test them hard, I said, but there the talk was taken into other lips. Zaman went forward to the front of the litter with the symbol of our Lord the Sun glowing in his hand, and burst into a flow of cursing. It was hard for me to hear his words. The roar of the waters which poured up over the land and beat in vast waves against the sacred mountain itself grew nearer and more loud. But the old man had his say. Foranice gave orders to her guards for his killing. Yes tried even to rise from the litter and do the work herself. But Zaman held the symbol to his front, and its power in that supreme moment mastered all the arts that could be brought against it. The majesty of the Most High Gods was vindicated, and that splendid Empress knew it and lay back sullenly amongst the cushions of her litter, a beaten woman. 
Only one person in that rigid knot of people found power to leave the rest, and that was Ilga. She came out to the side of the ark and leaned up and cried me a farewell through the gathering roar of the flood. "'I would I might save you and take you with us,' I said. "'As for that,' she said with a gesture, "'I would not come if you asked me. I am not a woman that will take anything less than all. But I shall meet what comes presently with the memory that you will have me always somewhere in your recollection. I know somewhat of men, even men of your stamp, Deucalion, and you will never forget that you came very near to loving me once." I think, too, she said something further concerning Nais, but the bellowing rush of the waters drowned all other words. A great mist made from the stream sent up by the swamped burning mountain stopped all accurate view, though the blaze from the fires lit it like gold. But I had a last sight of a horde of soldiery rushing up the slopes of the mountain, with a scum of surge billowing at their heels, and licking many of them back in its clutch. And then my eye fell on old Zaman waving to me with the symbol to shut down the door in the roof of the ark. I obeyed his last command and went down the stair, and closed all ingress behind me. There were bolts placed ready, and I shot these into their sockets and there were Nais and I alone, and cut off from all the rest of our world that remained. I went to the place where she lay and put my arms tightly around her. Without, we heard men beating desperately on the ark with their weapons, and some even climbed by the battens to the top and wrenched to try and move the door from its fastenings. The end was coming very nearly to them now, and the great crowd of them were mad with terror. I would have given much to have known how Foranice fared in that final tumult and how she faced it. I could see her, with her lovely face and her wondrous eyes and her ruddy hair curling about her neck, and by all the gods I thought more of her at that last moment than of the poor land she had conquered and misgoverned and brought to this horrid destruction. There is no denying the fascination which Foranice carried with her. But the end did not dally long with its coming. There was a little surge that lifted the ark a hand's breadth or so in its cradle, and set it back again with a jar and a quiver. The blows from axes and weapons ceased on its lower part, but redoubled into frenzied batterings on its rounded roof. There were some screams and cries also, which came to us but dully through the thickness of its ponderous sheathing, though likely enough they were sent forth at the full pitch of human lungs outside and when another surge came, roaring and thundering, which picked up the great vessel as though it had been a feather and spun it giddily, and after that we touched earth or rock no more. We tossed about on the crest and troughs of delirious seas, a sport for the greedy gods of the ocean. The lamp had fallen, and we crouched there in darkness, dully weighed with a burden of knowledge that we alone were saved out of what was yesterday a mighty nation. End of chapter 19。Chapter 20 of The Lost Continent。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lost Continent by C. J. Cutcliffe Hine. Chapter 20 on the bosom of the deep. The ark was rudderless, oarless, and machineless, and could travel only where the high gods chose. The inside was dark and full of an ancient smell, and crowded with groanings and noise. I could not find the firebox to relight the fallen lamp, and so we had to endure blindly what was dealt out to us. The waves tossed us in merciless sport, and I clung on by the side of Nais holding her to the bed. We did not speak much, but there was full companionship in our bereavement and our silence. When Atlantis sank to form a new ocean bed, she left great whirlpools and spoutings from her drowned fires as a fleeting legacy to the gods of the sea. And then, I think, though in the black belly of the ark we could not see these things, a vast hurricane of wind must have come on next so as to leave no piece of the desolation incomplete. For seven nights and seven days did this dreadful turmoil continue, as counted for us afterwards by the reckoner of hours which hung within the ark, 
and then the howling of the wind departed, and only the roll of a long still swell remained. It was regular, and it was oily, as I could tell by the difference of the motion, and then for the first time I dared to go up the stair and open the door which stood in the roof of the ark. The sweet air came gushing down to freshen the foulness within, and as the ark rode dryly over the seas, I went below and brought up Nais to gain refreshment from the curing rays of our lord the sun. Duly the pair of us adored him, and gave thanks for his great mercy in coming to light another day. And then we laid ourselves down where we were to doze, and take that easy rest which we so urgently needed. Yet, though I was tired beyond words, for long enough sleep would not visit me. Wearily I stared out over the oily sunlit waters. No blur of land met the eye. The ring of ocean was unbroken on every side, and overhead the vault of heaven remained unchanged. The bosom of the deep was littered with the poor wreckage of Atlantis, to remind one, if there had been a need, that what had come about was fact and not some horrid dream. Trees, squared timber, a smashed and upturned boat of hides, and here and there the rounded corpse of a man or beast shouldered over the swells, and kept convoy with our ark as she drifted on in charge of the gods and the current. But sleep came to me at last, and I dropped off into unconsciousness, holding the hand of Nais in mine, and when next I woke I found her open-eyed also and watching me tenderly. We were finally rested, both of us, and rest and strength bring one complacency. We were more ready now to accept the station which the high gods had made for us without repining, and so we went below again into the belly of the ark to eat and drink and maintain strength for the new life which lay before us. A wonderful vessel was this ark, now we were able to see it at leisure and intimately. Although for the first time now in all its centuries of life it swam upon the waters, it showed no leak or sun-crack. Inside even its floor was bone-dry. That it was built from some wood one could see by the grainings, but nowhere could one find suture or joint. The living timbers had been put in place and then grown together by an art which we have lost today, but which the ancients knew with much perfection and afterwards some treatment, which is also a secret of those forgotten builders, had made the wood as hard as metal and impervious to all attacks of the weather. In the gloomy cave of its belly were stored many matters. At one end, in great tanks on either side of Central Alley, was a prodigious store of grain. Sweet water was in other tanks at the other end. In another place were drugs and samples, and essences of the life of beasts all these things being for use whilst the ark roamed under the guidance of the gods on the bosom of the deep. On all the walls of the ark, and on all the partitions of the tanks and the other woodwork, there were carved in the rude art of bygone time representations of all the beasts which lived in Atlantis. And on these I looked with a hunter's interest, as some of them were strange to me and had died out with the men who had perpetuated them in these sculptures. There was a good store of weapons, too, and the tools for handicrafts. Now for many weeks our life endured in this ark, as the gods drove it about here and there across the face of the waters. We had no government over direction, we could not by so much as a hair's breadth a day increase her speed. The high gods that had chosen the two of us to be the only ones saved out of all Atlantis had sole control of our fate and into their hands we cheerfully resigned our future direction. Of that land which we reached in due time, and where we made our abiding place, and where our children were born, I shall tell of in its place. But since this chronicle has proceeded so far in an exact order of the events as they came to pass, it is necessary first to narrate how we came by the sheets on which it is written. In a great coffer, in the center of the ark's floor, the whole of the mysteries learned during the study of ages were set down in accurate writing. I read through some of them during the days which passed, and the awfulness of the powers over which they gave control appalled me. I had seen some of these powers set loose in Atlantis, and was a witness of her destruction. But here were powers far higher than those. Here was the great secret of life and death which Foranice also had found 
and for which she had been destroyed. And there were other things also, of which I cannot even bring my stylo to scribe. The thought of being custodian of these writings was more than I could endure, and the more the matter rested in my mind, the more intolerable became the burden. And at last I took hot irons, and with them seared the wax on the sheets till every letter of the old writings was obliterated. If I did wrong, the high gods in their infinite justice will give me punishment. If it is well that these great secrets should endure on earth, they in their infinite power will dictate them afresh to some fitting scribes. But I destroyed them there as the ark swayed with us over the waves. And later, when we came to land, I rewrote upon the sheets the matters which led to great Atlantis being dragged to her death throes. Nice, that I love so tenderly. Translator's Note the remaining sheets are too broken to be legible. End of chapter 20 End of The Lost Continent by C. J. Cutcliffe Hine